second one, last time we were talking about this evaluation homomorphism, right? So, so that was the function phi sub alpha from um, f, oops, f bracket x to e, where um, we define it as phi sub alpha of um, <clears throat> a polynomial. Um, and I want to avoid thinking of p of x as a function, but guess what? That's what we're doing. We're treating it as a function. What it really is, <laughs> is taking the variable or uh, the, 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 the constant alpha and plugging it in for the variable x, right? So that's really what's going on right there. Um, let me just give you a couple of examples. So um, let's look at, oh, so, so R is a subfield of C, and then we need to choose, remember the alpha is chosen in this field E. Um, let's take I. <clears throat> All right, there's an element of C. So let's look at evaluation just in this setting. So phi sub I is then <clears throat> a homomorphism from R bracket X to C. Right, so this is a homomorphism. And so for example, phi sub i, oh, phi sub i of 1 plus uh, x plus x squared is going to give us 1 plus i plus i squared, which is negative 1. And so we just get i. Um, another example. So let's look at um, Z5. So Z5 is a subfield of Z5. It's true. And then let's take 2. Right, 2 lives in Z5. And so we can do phi sub 2. Right, that will be a homomorphism from Z5 bracket X. <clears throat> to z5, and so for example, if we do phi sub 2 of um, 1 plus x plus x to the fourth, um, that's going to be 1 plus uh, 2 plus, um, let's see, uh, 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 16 mod 5, um, 16 mod 5 is 1, all right, so we get 4. Uh, this next definition is why this class exists. Well, maybe that's exaggerating a little bit, but this is important. Um, so, um, let F be a subfield of E. Anytime when I write an F and an E, <clears throat> and I use this subring notation, it means subfield. So when you read this, F is a subfield of E. Uh, alpha is an element of E. This is going to be kind of our standard setup. Um, and then I need some polynomial, which I want to call, um, I guess, P of X. So P of X in F bracket X. Now, if uh, phi sub alpha of P of X equals zero, then... <clears throat> Alpha is called a zero, or I often call them roots, but it's, you know, the, 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 the standard word is zero, but I'll just say or root of P of X, right? When we talk about zeros of polynomials, what do we mean? We mean numbers so that when you plug them into the polynomial, right, substitute that number for each of the... Uh, for each occurrence of x, add all that stuff up. If you get zero, then we call it a zero or a root of the polynomial. Now, um, this is just this is one of the fundamental problems of, of ancient mathematics: finding zeros of polynomials. So, um, 
kind of guided mathematics for a long time. So um, let's say it like this, finding zeros of polynomials um, uh, was one of the fundamental uh, problems of ancient mathematics. And this problem, I mean, it continues even today. Right? So it's, it's been one of the guiding principles, one of the things that has created lots and lots of mathematics is this idea of finding the zeros of polynomials. <clears throat> now, when you combine our previous theorem, so theorem um, uh, 22.3 plus the way we phrase this definition. Now notice, this is not how you learn, you know, when you're in sixth grade or whatever, this is not what you learned about or how you learn the definition of what a root of a polynomial is, right? A root of a polynomial is a number that satisfies this, right? P of alpha equals zero means that alpha is a zero. Notice that I phrased it a little bit differently here. I phrased it in terms of the evaluation homomorphism. And, and the reason for this is that it reframes the problem. So it allows us to think about this problem. So let's say theorem 22 plus 23 plus uh, our definition. Um, frames the question or the, the problem of finding zeros in terms of homomorphisms. So somehow it tells us that the idea of finding zeros of polynomials is connected to the study of ring homomorphisms. Sorry, in particular, the evaluation homomorphisms. Right, so it just gives us a more, more, more advanced way of thinking about uh, zeros of polynomials, rather than just saying p of alpha equals zero, what it really means is the evaluation homomorphism applied to that polynomial is equal to zero at that given alpha. <coughs> now, the Greeks, right, they were the, sort of the, the first, well, not the first, but they were early, you know, they, they had, they, they contributed quite a bit to early mathematics. Um, <coughs> so the Greeks, Um, they, they were really studying polynomials whose coefficients were integers. So the Greeks um, uh, uh, considered um, yeah, polynomials in z bracket x. So they really, they like to have the coefficients to be integers, the coefficients of their polynomials. Now they were okay with zeros that were not necessarily integers, right? They accepted that. They were okay with zeros being rational numbers. They were not happy with the idea of zeros being irrational numbers. Um, <clears throat> so let's say they We're comfortable with zeros lying in Q, <clears throat> but um, they just they didn't approve. They 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 just they didn't they were they were not okay with it. But but we're I don't know how to say this. Not okay with irrational. zeros, right? The idea of an irrational number was just sort of abhorrent to them. And in fact, I mean, the story goes something like this. You know, the Pythagoreans were, were mathematicians, but they were also mystics, right? They, they, um, 
study the, you know, the, 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 the idea of religion and numbers were connected. And <clears throat> uh, at some point, one of them realized, you know what? There are irrational numbers out there, right? You just got to deal with it. And so he discovered, I, I don't know the story that well, but somehow the person who first, we'll say, discovered irrational numbers and showed that they existed made the Pythagoreans so angry that they took him out. When I first heard the story, I heard that they cut his tongue out. But then I heard the story again, and, it's, and it turned out that they drowned him. So, or maybe they did both, I don't know. So anyways, the, the Greeks, the Pythagoreans in particular, were not comfortable with the idea of irrational numbers. Right? To the point that they either cut someone's tongue out or drowned them or both. So it was, um, it, <clears throat> it was not safe to believe in irrational numbers back in those days. Okay, so this next theorem, you probably learned this, uh, I, don't, I want to say pre-calculus, maybe even before. You might have learned it in, in you know, eighth, you know, algebra, eighth grade or something like that. So it goes like this, um, theorem 22.4, it's called the rational root test. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, let's let um, f of x equal, um, so I need some polynomial, let's say a0 plus a1x plus dot 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 plus a sub n x to the n, and I want this to be in z bracket x, right? The, the, the Greeks were interested in polynomials that had coefficients in z, but as I said, they're okay with rational roots, so uh, what do I need? Um, uh, p over q, that's going to be a rational number, and I want it to be reduced. Remember, rational numbers are, are fractions. Uh, it's really an equivalence class of fractions, and so we want to choose the reduced form or the reduced representative. Um, so uh, where the GCD of um, P and Q is equal to 1, so that gives us the reduced representative of the fraction. And um, I want, so I want this polynomial to be a degree n polynomial, so I need a n to be non-zero. And I also need, I also want this term right here to be non-zero. So let's say and uh, a zero and a n not equal to zero. Okay, so there's our setup. <clears throat> now if, um, if now I'm, gonna, I'm just going to write this in this form like this. So if f of alpha is equal to zero, meaning <clears throat> right, when you plug alpha into this polynomial right here, you get you get zero. If alpha f alpha is equal to zero, then uh, two things have to be true. Let's get these in the right order. P divides a zero and Q divides a sub n. Right, so what this theorem does, it gives you candidates for who rational roots of a polynomial with integer coefficients can be, right? If you take a rational number and it doesn't satisfy these two facts, then it can't be a zero, right? So it allows you, it kind of allows you to create a list of potential rational roots, and then you can take each one of those, plug it in, and see, right? If you get zero, great. If you get all non-zero for all of those, then guess what? That polynomial has no non, uh, has no rational roots. <clears throat> So now for the proof, um, oh, no, I don't need to say let. Let's, so what we have is, we have, um, so let's see, if I plug P over Q into this polynomial, what we get is A0 plus A1 times P over Q plus dot, dot, dot plus a sub n p over q raised to the n equal to zero. All right, that's just what happens. If you take p over q and plug it into that polynomial, um, what we get is zero. So now what I want to do, um, let's see, what am I going to do? I'm going to move... What am I going to do? I'm going to, oh, okay, so I'm going to multiply by both sides of this equation by q to the n, and then I'm going to move the constant term, so to speak, over to the other side, right? So then 
Uh, let's see, if I hit everything by Q to the N and move the first term or the zero term over to the other side, I want a negative there. So this is going to be um, A1 um, times, let's make sure I don't screw this up, so I'm multiplying by Q to the N. So this will be A1 times PQ to the n minus 1 plus a2 p squared q that would be a q squared there so that'd be a q to the n minus 2 plus dot 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 plus eventually we'll get to a n p to the n is equal to negative a0 q to the n So just check the arithmetic here. What I did, multiply both sides of this polynomial by q to the n. We're essentially clearing the fractions out. And then, um, uh, and then what? Oh, and then I'm moving the zero term over to the other side. Let's just make sure I got my arithmetic correct. Yes. And so now what I want to do is I'm going to pull one factor of p out of the left-hand side. So we can say, and so p times a1 q to the n minus 1 plus a2 p q n minus 2 plus dot 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 plus a n p to the n minus 1 is equal to a0, oh, negative a0, q to the n. <clears throat> okay, so what does that say or what does that tell us? It tells us... <clears throat> that p times this integer right here is equal to the right-hand side. So it follows that p divides uh, a, we don't need the minus sign, a0 times q to the n. Ah, and in fact, I want to keep going with this sentence, and Right? So P divides this product right here because P and Q are relatively prime. That forces us to conclude that P divides A0. So we can say, and since uh, GCD of P and Q equals 1, we have, uh, or we conclude that, that P divides A sub 0, right? So there's the first part we need. Now we need to show that Q divides. Um, so similarly, um, now what am I going to do? I'm going to, let's see, how do I do that? Right. So similarly, so now what I want to do is go back to this equation right here, put the a0, q to the n back on that side, and move this piece to the other side, this last term right there. So similarly, what we would get is uh, a0, q to the n plus a1, P, Q to the N minus 1 plus dot 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 plus A sub N minus 1, P to the N minus 1, um, Q, uh, so, yep, is equal to minus A N P to the N. And so, now I can factor a Q out of each piece on the, on the left-hand side. So we get Q times A0, Q to the N minus 1, plus dot, 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 plus A sub N minus 1, P to the N minus 1, is equal to uh, negative A N, P to the N. All right, this is actually pretty straightforward. I'm actually enjoying this as we go. Um, and so, what does this tell us? Um, so this implies, 
It's like sometimes you don't do a proof for a long time and you kind of forget the details. I forgot the details, and now as I look at it, I, go, I like this proof. This is kind of fun. I haven't done it for a couple of years, so um, so this implies uh, that um, Q divides. So for the same reason, right? P and Q are relatively primed. This tells us that Q divides the product because P and Q are relatively primed. It forces us to conclude that Q divides A sub n. So this implies that Q divides A sub n. That's what we need. <clears throat> it's a quick corollary. I think you're going to like this. Um, yeah, let's put it down here. So corollary um, uh, 22.5 is that, let's just write it like this, square root of 2 is irrational. You already know, we already know that square root of 2 is irrational. In math 248, you probably went through a proof by contradiction that square root of 2 is irrational. That's a fun proof. Right, but now we have another way to prove that the square root of 2 is irrational, and this is just as a quick consequence of the rational root test. And so the proof goes like this. If um, P over Q is a rational number, um, so if this is a 0 of... Um, uh, the polynomial x squared minus 2, right, then what does that mean? <clears throat> so then p has to divide the constant coefficient and q has to divide the largest coefficient. So q divides 1. Uh, okay, so what does that mean? That means that p is going to be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, q is plus or minus 1. So thus, um, the fraction p over q has to equal plus or minus um, 2, or well, plus or minus 1, or plus or minus 2. <clears throat> Alright, so those are the only possible roots, rational roots, sorry, only possible rational roots of this polynomial right here. And so, um, so what does that mean then, or how do you interpret this, or what do you do with this? You take each one of these, you plug it in here, and you say, guess what? They are not solutions of that polynomial. Um, since plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2 are not zeros of x squared minus 2, we conclude that square root of 2. What does square root of 2 mean? It means the positive root of this polynomial right here, and it can't be a rational number, so it has to be irrational. So conclude that this is irrational. All right, so that's pretty fun. And here's the nice thing. The proof, the proof that you learn in Math 248 that tells us that square root of 2 is um, is irrational, that proof by contradiction, it doesn't really generalize to, to, to other numbers, right? 3 and 5 and so on. This proof right here can generalize very quickly to show us that the square root of any prime number is irrational by just replacing x squared minus 2 with this, uh, well, I guess I should use p, huh? um, whatever, um, uh, uh, R, where R is a prime number. Okay? So the nice thing about this corollary right here, or this using the rational root, it's rational root test, it's easy to show that the square root of any prime number is actually an irrational number. All right, in fact, let's write that down. Um. <clears throat> Um, so this easily generalizes um, to show that 
square root of p is irrational for all primes p. Ah, this is a time when I wish that we were in, you know, that we were in the same room together so we could just talk about this. This is exciting, right? This is why math is fun, right? When you see, wow, here's another way to prove the square root of two is irrational, and then it generalizes to 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 all um, to all square roots of primes. Um, I think I've been having some <laughs> some difficulties here, technical difficulties. So I don't even know how far how long I've been talking because I had to cut. Um, I don't even know how long this lecture is. Um, let me just say a little bit more, I don't know, I guess just like sort of not quite historical, but let me just kind of put this in context and then I'm going to quit. This might be a little bit of a short lecture, but that's okay. <clears throat> um, so let's just give this as a general question. Kind of give an indication of where we're headed when it comes to the study of polynomials. <clears throat> um, so, given a field F, and um, uh, uh, polynomial, so um, let's we'll say F of X in F bracket X. Does there exist a field, say capital E, that contains F? Uh, does there exist a field E and um, alpha in E such that? f of alpha is equal to zero, or if you like, the evaluation map applied to f of x equal to zero. So, and it's like kind of a slick way to phrase that. So, um, um, is uh, f of x an element of the kernel of phi sub alpha? For does there exist an alpha, right? Is there some alpha so that f of x lies in the kernel? Um, now, if so, and, and let me uh, like phrase this better, uh, for some alpha, and right, so let's say, so let's say, if so, what does e? look like. All right, so you've got this field, you've got a polynomial. All right, so we take f of x in capital F bracket x. <clears throat> then the question becomes, okay, maybe there are no roots for the polynomial that live in f, right? There's no element of the field f that contains it. <clears throat> oh, man. Oh, and I screwed up my general question, too. I wanted to say, does there exist a field? Jeez, I'm sorry. I'm having a bad day today. Um, does there exist a field E with a F contained in E? So here's, let me try to phrase this correctly now. So you'd start off with a polynomial in F bracket X. Can you expand F in such a way that you actually create a zero of this polynomial, you're right? You might run through all of F and say, hey, there's nobody in F, so that when I plug it into little f of X, we get zero. Can we expand F? Right? That's where this part comes. Can we expand it? So that by enlarging it, we actually find a zero of the polynomial f of x. Right? Um, now, <clears throat> um, 
the rational root test is kind of related to that question right there. Um, so the rational root test is related to this question. Now, this is not totally obvious, but here it's in the case where, um, so let's say in the case f equals q. Um, this is not totally obvious, so um, I don't want to say this. Um, so not obvious, since the rational root test is uh, phrased in terms of um, polynomials in, in Z bracket X, right, where Z is not a field. <clears throat> But here's the idea then, um, the rational root test tells us exactly which rational roots you can have for polynomials, right, whose coefficients are in Z. Right? So, uh, like I said, I think I'm kind of having a bad day today in, in terms of mistakes and so on. I've actually had to start and stop and re you know, you, you're not catching all this because I'm cutting it out. But anyways, that's enough for today. Um, even if this is a bit of a short lecture, I'll pick up and hopefully <laughs> I'll be a little more coherent um, um, uh, on the next lecture.